Our today's webinar is titled Ireland's Rare Fish. And today's speakers, we have Dr. Tara Gallagher and Nick Lowe Gorman, both work in research and development division in IFI. They're particularly interested in fish species of conservation concern in Ireland. And both also monitor and report on fish species protected under the EU Habitats Directive. So today we're going to be talking to you about some of Ireland's rarest fish species, including lamprey, shad, pollen and arctic char. As well as being rare, they're probably also some of the lesser known species to occur in Ireland, and they are all of conservation concern. We'll be talking about their ecology, life cycles, where they're found in Ireland, a little bit on how we sample for them and also their conservation status. So without further ado, I'm going to start with our lamprey species. Firstly, you can't talk about lampreys without mentioning how ancient they are on the evolutionary scale. Today's lampreys are living fossils. They're one of two of the oldest living vertebrate groups, along with the hagfishes. They've remained largely unaltered for 360 million years, so their life strategy really works. It has endured over millions of years, and they have survived at least four major extinction events. Lampreys are eel-like in appearance, but are not to be confused with eels. They have no lower jaw, but instead the mouth is surrounded by an oral disc, which contains a set of rasping teeth, and parasitic lamprey use this oral disc to attach to host fish, where they feed off the skin, flesh, and body fluids of their prey. Another distinguishing feature is the seven gill openings on each side of the head. The skeleton is cartilage rather than bone, and they don't have paired fins or scales. Adult lampreys have two dorsal fins, which are often continuous with the tail fins. In Ireland, there are three lamprey species, the sea, river, and brook lamprey. Sea lamprey are the largest of the Irish lampreys. They can reach 100 centimeters in length, Sea lamprey are anadromous, which means they feed at sea and return to fresh water to spawn. And as adults, they are parasitic on other fish species. River lamprey measure 25 to 30 centimetres. They too have an anadromous life cycle and adults are parasitic. Brook lamprey are the smallest of the Irish lampreys. Adults may reach 16 centimetres in length. They spend the entire life cycle in fresh water. When they reach the adult stage, they stop feeding, so they are non-parasitic. Lampreys have a fascinating life cycle. They spawn in rivers where they build nests or reds in the gravels in good flow conditions. When the larvae hatch out, they drift downstream and burrow into silt beds at the margins of rivers. The larvae are blind and they live a worm-like existence for a number of, number of years, filter feeding until they metamorphose into juveniles four to six years later. This is a bizarre stage in the life cycle, but this burrowing habit probably explains why they have been so successful for a as a species over time. Following metamorphosis, juveniles of the anadromous lampreys move downstream to estuaries to feed. Brook lamprey juveniles don't feed but overwinter in fresh water before spawning the following spring. Adults of all three lamprey species die after spawning. During metamorphosis, you get quite a dramatic change in morphology from the larval to the juvenile stage. It takes place over a few months, usually between July and September. And these photos we would have taken ourselves when out sampling, and they show the stages involved in the process. So as I was saying, the larvae are blind and they don't have an oral disc, but instead the mouth is surrounded by an oral hood. At this stage, it's not possible to tell brook and river larvae apart, but there are some subtle differences to allow you to distinguish sea lamprey larvae. Later on, the larvae become known as transformers. They become more silver in color and the skin over the eyes clears so that the eyes are more visible, as you can see from the photo. The two photos in the bottom right corner of the screen show post-metamorphic brook and river juveniles. The eyes are much more developed and at this stage it's possible 
to distinguish between the two species. For one thing, the river lamprey are more silvery in appearance in preparation for their migration to estuaries to feed. Once juvenile river and sea lampreys move into estuaries and out to sea, they attach themselves to fish and feed off the skin and muscle tissue of their prey. In the photos on the left, you can see some of the wound marks they leave on fish. Sea lampreys are even known to attach to elasmobranchs like this basking shark. As well as being predators, lamprey themselves are preyed upon by other species. They are particularly vulnerable during the freshwater spawning period when they can be a source of food for birds such as herons and kingfishers, and for mammals like this otter here, which has captured a river lamprey. So in that particular photo, you have the scenario where one protected species is feeding on another. Sea lamprey spawn in May to July, and they build large reds, usually about a metre long and wide, in fast flowing zones, especially at the top of riffle areas. They excavate the reds by moving stones with their oral discs, and they also fan the sediments with their tail, much like salmon. Individual reds are very distinctive in form. You, had a, you have a depression in the sediment where spawning takes place, and directly behind this, you have a mound of excavated gravels. River and brook lampreys spawn earlier in the year, in March to April, when water temperatures reach about 10 degrees centigrade. Their reds are smaller than sea lamprey reds, generally consisting of oval depressions about 20 to 40 centimetres across and 2 to 10 centimetres deep. Often you might see a freshening of the gravels in comparison to surrounding sediments, as in the centre picture, which shows some river lamprey reds on the Ockram River in Wicklow. The photo on the left shows a river lamprey red taken only a few weeks ago on the Slaney. So here are the sampling methods we use in our monitoring program for lampreys. Surveys are carried out for both the larval and adult life stages. We electrofish for larval lamprey in the silt beds along the margins of rivers. The slide shows a photo of some larvae captured during a survey. There are a few age classes present and if you look closely, you can see one of the individuals is silver in colour, so it has metamorphosed to the juvenile stage. Red counts are used to survey adult lampreys and we also carry out float over surveys to investigate the extent of sea lamprey spawning. Lampreys are protected under the EU Habitats Directive, so there's an obligation that they achieve or attain favourable conservation status. They're listed in Annex 2 of the Directive, which means that special areas of conservation have to be designated for lampreys. In the most recent conservation status assessment from 2019, brook lamprey have a favourable status, and as you can see from the map, they have a widespread distribution. So brook lamprey are doing very well in Ireland. The status of sea lamprey, on the other hand, was assessed as bad, and this is due particularly to the low population size and the issue of migration barriers, namely weirs, which prevent adequate access to spawning and nursery habitat in many rivers. Due to a deficiency of data, current status of river lamprey is unknown and there will be a strong focus on river lamprey in our monitoring programme over the next few years. We're now going to talk about twait shad. Twait shad are pelagic fish belonging to the herring family, but with a freshwater spawning phase. They occur along the west coast of Europe from Norway to Spain. They are herring-like in appearance, but more deep-bodied. They occur in coastal and inshore waters and then return to freshwater to spawn. Their abundance has declined in Europe and like lampreys, they're protected under the Habitats Directive. All of the special areas of conservation for Twait Shad are in the southeast of the country. And there are spawning populations on the Barrow, Shore and the Munster Blackwater. Twait shad enter rivers in April and spawning occurs in May and June. They spawn over gravels and cobbles in flowing water. In Ireland, they tend to spawn at the top of the tidal limit in the SAC rivers. Spawning occurs at night and involves a lot of splashing at the surface. The fertilised eggs drift to the bottom and hatch within four to six days. The larvae then move into quieter, slower flowing areas of the river 
and as juveniles move downstream to estuaries in the autumn. Twee chad are multi-annual spawners and it's likely that they show fidelity to natal rivers. This slide shows some of the sampling methods we use for shad. These include egg kick sampling surveys to determine the location and timing of spawning events, seine netting and trawling surveys for juveniles, and we've also carried out telemetry studies where we've tagged fish to investigate the movement and behaviour of twee chad during the spawning period. The conservation status of twee chad was assessed as bad in the most recent Habitats Directive Article 17 report. This was due mainly to the low population size and the area and quality of habitat available for spawning. Hi there, my name is Nicola and I'm here to talk about some of our conservation fish species, in particular pollen, Killarney shad and Arctic char. So I'm just going to start with a quick biology of the three species. All three species dwell in pelagic or open water. All three species are part of our natural heritage and some of the first vertebrates to colonise Ireland after the Ice Age. Pollen and Arctic char are members of the Salmonid family, while Killarney shad are members of the warm water Culpillid family. The three species are at the thermal limit of their range here in Ireland. They were once abundant where they occurred and now are in decline or locally extinct. Pollen are only found in five lakes in Ireland, shown here on the map in blue. Killarney shad are only found in Loch Lean, shown in red down in Kerry. The Arctic char are generally along the west coast of Ireland, um, shown as black dots. There were populations in the Midlands and along the east coast, but these are now extinct. There's legislation in place to protect these fish species. Pollen and Killarney shad are protected by Annex 5 of the Habitats Directive. Killarney shad is also um, listed under Annex 2 of the Habitats Directive, which means that it needs to have a designated SAC or Special Area of Conservation. Killarney shad is listed in the Killarney National Park, McGillicuddy Reeks and Cara River Catchment SAC. In the most recent assessment of Article 17 of the Habitats Directive, pollen was assessed as bad and Killarney shad was assessed as favourable. All three species are listed as vulnerable on the Irish Red Data Book species list. Killarney shad are a landlocked weight shad species. Similar populations occur in the Mediterranean and the Balkans. They grow to approximately 35 centimetres in length. It was suggested that they spawn over shallow gravels near the larger islands in June or July, but the exact locations are unknown. They form big shoals in the open water pelagic zone. Juveniles predominantly feed on zooplankton. They don't appear to be sensitive to nutrient enrichment, and climate warming may not be a big problem as they are a warm water species. In the most recent reporting cycle for Article 17 of the Habitats Directive, the status of Killarney Shad was assessed to be favourable, as it has been in the last two assessments. The range of the Killarney Shad is protected within Killarney National Park. The continual presence of adult fish in successive fish surveys indicates ongoing successful spawning efforts. The continued absence of introduced species from Loch Lean is crucial to the continued success of Killarney Shad. Any disruption of the ecology of the lake could be detrimental to the species. Pollen are a member of the Salmonid family. They are a relic species of the Ice Age. Ireland has the only sub-Arctic population of pollen. Other populations exist in Russia, Canada and Alaska. Pollen are the only European vertebrate which are found uniquely in Ireland. The Irish population of pollen are unique in that they spend their whole life in fresh water. Other populations migrate to sea, unlike our population. Pollen are conspecific with Artisisco. This is an anandromous species that overwinters in large Siberian, Alaskan and Canadian rivers and feeds in summer in the near shore corridor of the Arctic Ocean. In Ireland, they are found on Loch Allen, Loch Rhea and Loch Derg on the Shannon system and also on Loch Snay and Lower Loch Urn. Pollen spawn in December and the eggs are deposited on graveled, exposed rocky shores of the lake bed. These spawning observations are from Loch Ney. There are no documented spawning events from the Shannon. After approximately two months, in around February, the fry hatch. The fry are fast growing and can get to lengths of seven centimetres by June and 15 centimetres by their first year. The maximum length is approximately 35 centimetres. Pollen are re relatively short lived, living until they're about five, five or six years old. They become sexually mature after two years. 
Over the years, we have trialled a number of methods for sampling pollen. These include bongo netting, hydroacoustics and pelagic netting. Under the Habitats Directive, IFI were tasked with reporting on all life stages of the species being monitored. We previously used bongo nets to successfully sample juvenile shad on some of the southern rivers and tried to use this technique to monitor for juvenile pollen. Similar studies had successfully been undertaken on Loch Ney. The bongo net, which you can see in the centre of this slide, is suspended over the bow of the boat while the boat slowly moves forward, catching the juvenile pollen. On Loch Ree, we sampled at 46 locations, of which 11 were positive. On Loch Allen, in spring 2014, we sampled at 24 locations and 16 were positive. A colleague who unfortunately is no longer with Inland Fisheries Ireland, Emma Marcy, completed her PhD thesis using hydroacoustic methods to estimate rare fish populations. Her thesis entitled Endangered Fish Species in Irish Lake, the Development of Sampling Protocols for Ecological and Conservation Status Assessment, provided us with a density for pollen. This was invaluable when reporting for Article 17 of the Habitats Directive. Emma's results demonstrated that the density of pollen decreased as you descend the Shannon. So you can see here um, the maximum record for pollen on Loch Allen is 390 pollen per hectare and on Loch Ree is 40 pollen per hectare and 16 on the lowest lake, Loch Derg. Between 2015 and 2017, we sampled Loch Allen, Ree and Derg on three occasions using pelagic nets. We had some questions we wanted to answer, um, such as would there be a difference in the size range of fish caught at different times of the year? Of what pelagic depth would the fish be captured? What was the gravid rate of the fish across the temporal time frame? In 2016, we sampled Loch Ree in June, September, and then the following February 2017. We set five pelagic nets at five different depth zones. Here is the length frequency of the pollen caught. The length of pollen captured ranged between 102 and 317 millimetres. The majority of fish fell within three size categories. Although the overall status of the pollen is assessed as bad, as in the previous two reporting periods, the trend is now known to be stable. Our monitoring of pollen has informed us that pollen appear to be sustaining themselves in the Shannon Lakes. Pollen abundance decreases as we descend the Shannon. Multiple anthropogenic stressors seem to be driving this trend and more research is needed. Pollen appear to be good biological indicators. Pelagic netting and hydroacoustics are used to monitor this species for the Habitats Directive. Arctic char are the world's most northerly distributed freshwater fish. In the Arctic Circle, anadromous lake and riverine populations occur. They can feed and grow at temperatures close to zero degrees Celsius. In Ireland, they only found in lakes and grow to around 35 centimetres and have been aged at nine years plus. They spawn over coarse gravel in winter and juveniles feed on zooplankton and benthic invertebrates. Arctic char are very sensitive to nutrient enrichment, climate warming, introduction of non-native species, acidification, sedimentation of spawning gravels. Arctic char are known to be in existence in 45 lakes in Ireland. Many populations are extinct or the current status is unknown. Declining populations are mainly due to the introduction of non-native species and the lack of coal or water habitat. There are a number of pressures and threats to these rare fish species. These include barriers to migration, for example weirs. These prevent the upward migration of river and sea lamprey and also trade chat to spawning areas. Poor water quality. The introduction of non-native or non-resident fish species. The introduction of invasive species such as zebra mussel and Asian clam. Water regulation or abstraction. Pollen and Arctic char spawn over gravel shores. If there is an alteration in water level at spawning times, the eggs may not survive. Climate change. Changes in precipitation or temperature. For example, trade chat spawn in May. In some recent years, there have been large floods in June. These floods wash away the young of the year who are too small to survive the increased flow conditions. Commercial fishing may lead to a reduction in prey species. This is a particular threat to river and sea lamprey and also to trade chat. Angling pressure or also bycatch from commercial fisheries. So how can we conserve these valuable fish species? There are four interlinked steps we can take. By continuing our research, we gain more knowledge into aspects of the particular species life cycle 
and what threats they may face at certain stage of their life, such as fry predation or competition for food with a non-native fish species. Knowing these threats and pressures, we can create policies and legislation to protect the species and their habitats. We can also create awareness with talks like this, so people will have an interest in protecting the habitats and species around them. Thank you for taking the time to learn about Ireland's rare fish species. I hope you enjoyed our presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask us now. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much, Nicola, and thank you very much, Tara. Great to hear about the different lamprey species, and also very interesting to hear that pollen are only found on five lakes in Ireland. Um, for our Q&A section, we're also joined by Dr. Sean Rooney. Um, Sean also works at Research and Development in IFI. Welcome, Sean. Hi there. Thanks for having me. So now we're going to our question and answer section. And for this section, my colleagues Aideen and Andy are joining us and they're going to field the questions to the team. Thank you. OK, so I have a question in here. Um, is it easy to tell the difference between lamprey reds and those of salmon and trout? OK, I'll come in there. Um, yes, they are similar, but you could not mistake them. And that's really because they spawn at different times of the year. So river and brook lamprey spawn in March, April, and then sea lamprey spawn a bit later on, May and June. So, so if you see reds at that time of the year, you know that they're, they're going to be lamprey and, and they couldn't be salmon and spawn, which, which, which spawn much later in the year. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I've got a question here. Uh, what has caused Arctic char to go extinct? Um, well, there's a, a number of reasons. Um, a lot of it is uh, introduced species, you know, such as uh, maybe the likes of um, zebra mussels or in some lakes, um, Asian clam, but also um, there's some lakes that we've surveyed in the past and um, the likes of perch or pike have been introduced and they just outcompete with the young char and uh, predate on them also. So that's one of the main reasons is just um, non-native species being introduced to the lakes. Fantastic, thanks for that. Um, I have another question in here. Um, any particular catch and release advice if you catch a char or pollen slash shad when out fishing for salmon and trout? Um, I think the same with any fish really for, for catch and release. Um, uh, shad are kind of a, a, at this time of the year are being angled for in um, St Mullins. So it's just a matter of just being really gentle with them when you're trying to uh, coax them back into the water, you know, so don't just lob them back in or anything, you know, just, you know, gently coax them, like, you know, hold them by the tail and, you know, hold them, well, not in the lake so much, but you know, hold them into the flow. So you're, you're just being very kind and very gentle and um, releasing them back. You'll notice as well with, with shad, they, they lose an awful lot of scales. So, you know, try and keep the, the handling down to down to a minimum as well. You will have to handle them at some stage, but um, just try and keep the, the handling down to a minimum. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, there's another question coming here. Um, Nicola, you say that pollen are the only European vertebrate found in Ireland. Um, I always thought that Sonahan uh, from Melvin and Dolohan in Loch Ney were unique as well and only found in those lakes. Um, sorry, it's I'm probably gonna... to do with um, subspecies cl classification. Um, those those varieties of of trout are, I don't think they're they're official subspecies, whereas the pollen is. So it comes down to actual taxonomic classification. Thanks for that. Um, why, why does pollen density dis decrease as you move down the Shannon? Um, I think this is once again down to introduce species that we have um, along the Shannon. You've got greater densities of the likes of coarse fish um, as you move down the Shannon um, from Loch Allen. And um, they, they're just out competing with the pollen, unfortunately. Um, also, entrepreneurs and, um, you know, the likes of big towns and 
um, like Athlone and I'm, I'm not blaming towns or anything, you know, but, you know, you've got a bit of eutrophication going on as well. Yeah, there, there are quite a few pressures really going on when you, when you, when you look at pollen, but, and it's not, you know, this, it's not completely understood either. So, you know, we'll probably need a lot of investigation, um, you know, as to why, why you are seeing, seeing these um, decrease in abundance. So, um, but yeah, there's certainly a lot of pressures there. Sorry, actually, Thanks just for your answer. One, one thing actually that we did notice is that um, although the, the density of um, pollen was really big on Loch Allen, like we caught an awful lot of fish, but they were a lot, a lot smaller. So there could be something to do with competition for them that they can't grow bigger. But as you uh, went down to Loch Ree, you got much, much bigger fish and they're much sturdier as well, you know, which, which is good. But um, possibly, and this is an MSPHD, is that, you know, there might be a bit of overcompetition as well in, in Loch Allen. So it is both to be said. You've got really, really good fish, uh, white, mighty fish in Loch Henry, and very few then we found in Loch Octor. Thanks for that. Uh, what do you see as the future for pollen and char in Ireland? That's a very difficult question. I'd, I'd like to see them increasing uh, the populations, um, which you know we'd all love to see, but. Um, Hopefully we don't lose any more char populations, you know, um, there are some surveys that I've done and um, we've repeated them um, where we've caught less char the second time around and um, perch seems to be um, an introduced species which really, really, once you get perch in, um, it, it is really, really difficult to get rid of them and the char populations um, do decrease. So just if people could stop introducing perch into places. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're not supposed to be there, um, but the future, I, I, God, I, just, I hope we don't lose any more populations, basically, you know, and um, climate change is a factor, like with increasing water temperatures, they need cold water, um, and water abstraction is another pressure on them as well, but I think, you know, that uh, places where there is water extraction going on, there's, there's a lot of communication between um, fisheries and um, council or whoever it is. Thank you for that. Um, uh, just another question here, sort of similar vein, I suppose. Um, is it possible to reintroduce the likes of Arctic char into locations where they have been deemed extinct? Um, we haven't done that here. I think it has been done in the UK. They've created um, reservoir populations that they'll use, but um, we we talked about it a few years ago, but we didn't get very far with um, like stripping the, the char that are there. Uh, we tried to actually catch them on Loch Sugar, the one, Loch Tal, no, it was, like, it was Loch Talt actually. Yeah. Um, but we just couldn't actually catch any to strip yeah. them. And then uh, it was going to be a program in the fish farm in Ross Gray, uh, the IFI fish farm, where they were going to on rear them then into juvenile populations, but it was just quite difficult to catch them. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there's another one in here. We did have one in about barriers, but uh, that, that was actually covered yesterday, so we won't ask that one. Um, I've got one there on, is there any records of char in Loch Ree? Um, I'm going to have to look at the map again, sorry. Uh, um, no, no. Uh, I think they were in Loch Ool and Loch Ennall, all right, in the Midlands. Um, but they, they haven't been found there for years, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, and here's another question. Is there, uh, is there something unique in the Shannon lakes that the pollen are staying for? So I suppose, why are they there as opposed um, to other places? I am not sure of that. <laughs> Sean? Yeah. <laughs> Depth. Uh, yeah, yeah. depth, size, size and, and depth. And the connectivity of the three of them, I say as well, you know, because, you know, let's say like Mokfus, Mokfus is very, very deep. Um, yeah. and, but then not there, but it's just that maybe the connectivity of the, the population. Yeah, we're, we're, we're still not sure exactly where the pollen spawn in, in any of the, the three lakes on, on the Shannon. 
we have our we have our suspicions where where it happens, but we've never actually never actually seen it. Um, so that that could be something to do with it as well. That there's that there's a there's a very optimal spawning habitat and conditions there in in those lakes. Okay, thank you. Um, another one that we've got in there is: uh, Do salmon and trout prey on lamprey? Yes. Um, they do. They. Oh, sorry, that's Tara. Do you want to take that one? <laughs> oh, um, well, really, the I suppose the lamprey are, you know, when they enter the fresh water, and um, they're that's their most vulnerable time, um, the life cycle. So, really, um, you know, you're going to get the main pre the main predators will be, you know, birds, as I was saying, such as heron, and uh, even kingfisher feeding on, on adult brook lamprey spawning. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm not so sure, actually, if, if, if you They've, get um, if trout been, and, and, and Yeah, I think they have been found in um, stomachs, stomach yeah. contents of pike yeah. and okay. trout, all right. Um, yeah. yeah. But I think it's it's, um, it's maybe a seasonal uh, prey that they're doing, you know, the, yeah. the lamprey are moving, you know, to try and find a spawning area um, in springtime and it's like us, like, you know, uh, when strawberries are in season, we eat strawberries or whatever. So the lamprey are moving around, so they're just going to eat what's there um, because they're free-flowing and free-swimming. Yeah, I mean, it's it's possible, certainly, when the when the juveniles are, are migrating, you know, downstream. Um, and the adults to, to the spawning, yeah, yeah, the adults to spawning areas as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just, I suppose, a comment here, really. Um, there was a char quote in Loch Derava, I'm pretty sure that's County West Meath, uh, during a competition a few years ago. So any comment on um, that? I wasn't aware of that, but um, I think surveys have been undertaken, and I think the Pike Project was done on, on Loch Derava, and they haven't been caught, so that's a very interesting record. It's something we might have to look into. Thank you.